ASRock workstation boards. The E3 V5 WS. It looked interesting to me, so I thought I would take a look. The C232 chipset is really about server workloads and the server platform. It doesn't really have as many features as the Z170 chipset. It's a much more minimal configuration. And we'll see that when we take a look at the board. So let's go through the board, the features on the board real quick. At the top edge of the board, we've got the eight pin CPU power connector and we've got the four pin fan header for the CPU fan. And just below that, we've got the CPU socket, of course. The CPU that you wanna be using is the Intel E3 V5 1200 series CPUs. Basically, you wanna be using a Xeon CPU with this motherboard, especially in order to be able to get features like error correcting memory, which is the real reason that you have the C232 chipset. And the motherboard does, of course, have four DDR4 RAM slots. At the back panel, we have two PS2 connections, one for a PS2 keyboard, one for a PS2 mouse. We have our four USB 3 ports. Then we've got our uh, onboard Ethernet. This is an Intel Gigabit NIC. Then we've got our Elna Audio. This is just a 7.1 audio solution. And that's pretty much it. That's pretty much everything that's back here. Most of the other connections are along the bottom edge of the board. This is where the HD audio is, the TPM header. We've got two USB 2.0 headers. We've got our six SATA 6 connections, our front panel connection the clear CMOS jumper, and then we've got two more four pin fan headers. Now looking at the PCI Express layout, it's kind of interesting. There are three PCIe by one and two by 16. Now on other motherboards, like a Z170 motherboard, the two by 16 slots would be split between the CPU. So the CPUs in this particular family have 16 PCI Express lanes, and then they have something else, a DMI 3.0 connection, that is like equivalent to four lanes of PCI Express connectivity, but you can run, you know, sort of, it can do multiplexing almost sort of kinda. So you can run multiple peripherals over that PCI Express by four connection. But things that are not using the PCI Express bus that's wired directly into the CPU will be limited to that total amount of bandwidth that's available, which is about four PCI Express 3.0 lanes worth of bandwidth. So what does that mean? It's like, well, this particular motherboard doesn't actually split the PCI Express lanes that are wired directly into the CPU between these two slots. That means that if you run a graphics card in the top slot here, it is always wired at 16, regardless of whatever is wired into PCIe 4. But that does mean the PCIe 4 can only run at 4x. So if you were going to try to run you know, uh, multiple video cards, your only option on this motherboard would be Crossfire. But that's not what this motherboard is built for. This motherboard is built to be, you know, multimedia content creation workstation motherboard that is sort of low cost and commodity. And so that's what we were taking a look at this motherboard for, for, you know, editor type jobs and things like that, because this kind of a job is going to have, you know, an SSD boot drive. It's going to have access to a lot of storage. It's going to need, you know, a pretty good network connection. Uh, it's only going to have one graphics card. And so what is the other PCI Express slot wired in? Well, it's that by four slot is connected through the DMI bus, which means that that slot also supports NVMe storage. So we would be able to use our Intel NVMe and boot from it in that secondary, you know, physical by 16 slot. We can also run a RAID controller or something like that off of that other slot, but it keeps our graphics card at by 16. Now, other motherboards, if you wanted to do that, you're going to be splitting your PCI Express lanes, eight lanes for the uh, graphics card and eight lanes for something else. If you were going to run a lot of PCI Express peripherals from a Skylake machine, then yeah, maybe that would make sense. You would have eight lanes for your graphics card, eight lanes for something else, and then you would have, you know, your by four video capture card. Maybe you would use by eight for your video capture card, and then one of the uh, PCIe by four DMI captures. But also absent from this motherboard is M.2. So normally M.2 shows up as a PCI Express by four connection, not on this motherboard. If you want to use M.2 with this motherboard, you would need to use an M.2 adapter in that second physical by 16 slot in order to be able to run that. I don't really see that as a downside in this particular motherboard. I just think it's something to call attention to so that you know exactly what you're getting. This actually could be really useful if you were actually looking for this particular configuration because you had something in mind that you wanted to build. But this is actually a good thing that the PCI Express situation on this motherboard is configured the way that it is, depending on what your particular build requirements are. Now, if you were going to run say an NVMe boot drive and a PCI Express video capture card, well, you're out of PCI Express lanes, so you're not gonna be able to do that. 
The reality is that if you have that many PCI Express peripherals though, you're not really going to want to do that on a platform that really only has 16 PCI Express lanes to begin with. You're going to want to run X99. You're not going to really be able to do that on the Skylake side of things. But being able to run the Xeon and the C232 chipset also means that you get error correcting memory. So if you wanted to combine this, this would make a perfectly excellent free NAS box because you could run error correcting memory, relatively low cost, but with a modern powerful Xeon CPU and with modern, very fast uh, PCI Express memory. You can use NVMe storage for caching and then you can use your six SATA 6 connections for six physical hard drives. Then you could use your X16 slot for 10 gigabit ethernet or something else. Hell, you could use the uh, the X16 slot for additional SATA hard drive connectivity or whatever and still be able to use your NVMe storage for lightning fast caching if you wanted to run that kind of a configuration. If you were running this as a small business server or a Linux box server or something like that, this PCI Express configuration is sort of no frills but no nonsense and it makes a lot of sense for those kinds of configurations. Also, even though I mentioned that this motherboard is compatible with the i3, i5, i7, notice what's missing from the backplane integrated video. This motherboard is not designed to be used with integrated video, mainly owing to the particular CPUs that this is designed to be used with, namely the Xeon CPUs. And there are some Xeon CPUs that integrate uh, built-in video with them, although in past generations it was a little bit of a debacle because Intel would, would say support only VGA, for example, on some Xeon parts and it led to a lot of confusion and weirdness. A lot of motherboard manufacturers um, for higher end server motherboards will actually put on IPMI controllers which have their own VGA controller. IPMI is of course the remote uh, management platform, remote management interface that you might see on a server motherboard. So this is meant for you know small business workstation use, maybe small business server, doesn't have a ton of, of remote access features, does not have IPMI or anything like that, but nonetheless is a no frills, no nonsense board that makes a perfectly reasonable basis for a machine that you might want to build using a Xeon CPU as a basis. This motherboard also does have one USB 3.0 header for front panel USB 3.0 connections. Now in terms of software support, the Linux support for this board seems to be very good. I tried both uh, Red Hat Enterprise Server, CentOS, um, and also SUSE. Everything seemed to work basically out of the box. I really didn't do extensive testing. I did not try to do fan control or, or fan speed monitoring or anything like that, but I did make sure that the CPU didn't overheat and the weird stuff didn't happen because sometimes weird stuff can happen. Basically everything worked as advertised as far as I could tell. In addition to being certified for Windows 10, Windows 7, and Windows 8, this motherboard is also certified for Windows Server 2012, 2012 R2, and on up. So if you want to get a Xeon and you want to run a Windows Server operating system with this motherboard, that will be no problem whatsoever. So what do I think after using this motherboard for a little while? I really like it. I like the fact that the graphics card is always by 16 regardless. The other by 16 slot, the second by 16 slot, runs a 4X through the DMI interface. That helps lower the cost of materials for the board, you know, no frills, no nonsense, they don't really have to figure a lot out. If you look at the layout of the motherboard, you can tell that it's a simplified layout, a reduced number of components, that kind of thing. You know, but still, it uses ASRock Super Alloy components. It seems to be built for durability and reliability. Time will tell if it measures up. But I do like the less is more approach of this. Instead of trying to figure out, you know, a thing to go between by 8 by 8 or by 16 and, you know, by 0, this motherboard is always by 16 and the second slot's always by 4. That's really its best feature. It's a simple, no-nonsense workstation board that makes a lot of sense if you're going to be doing, you know, video production, good all-around machine, and especially is a good choice if you're going to build a machine based around a Xeon CPU and error-correcting memory. Overall, I like it. But if you've got one of these and you have some information and you want to share with the rest of the group, then please do head on over to the forums at techsyndicate.com. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there. Music